Starting off this list in our number 10 spot, we have Carl Watts. Carl Watts, also known as Coral Eugene Watts, was an American serial killer who operated in the 1970s and 1980s. Born in Killeen, Texas, Watts was a quiet and unassuming individual who led a double life as a cold-blooded killer. Watts targeted and killed numerous women, primarily in Texas and Michigan. His victims were often young women and he would stalk them before attacking. Watts' crimes were characterized by their brutality and the lack of a discernible pattern, making it challenging for law enforcement to connect the cases. Despite his significant number of victims, Watts managed to evade capture for several years, partly due to his ability to blend into society and avoid suspicion. However, his luck ran out in 1982 when he was apprehended for burglary as well as an attempted killing. During questioning, he ended up confessing to multiple crimes, providing details that linked him to numerous unsolved cases. Watts eventually pleaded guilty to multiple counts and received a lengthy prison sentence. His cooperation with authorities allowed them to close several cold cases and bring closure to the families of his victims. Watts died of prostate cancer while serving his sentence on September 21st, 2007. Despite not achieving the same level of media coverage as some other infamous serial killers, Watts' actions left a trail of devastation and loss in the communities he targeted. In our number 9 spot today, we have Johann Unterwerger. Johann was an Austrian serial killer who terrorized Vienna in the 1990s. Johann's criminal activities first gained attention in the late 1970s when he was convicted for taking the life of a young woman and sentenced to life in prison. However, during his incarceration, he managed to project a very reformed image, becoming an accomplished writer and gaining support from intellectuals who believed he had been rehabilitated. Due to his literary talent and the perception of his redemption in a great miscarriage of justice, he was released on parole in 1990 after serving only 15 years of his life sentence. He soon became a media personality, presenting himself as a rehabilitated ex-convict and a crusader for the rights of prisoners. He even worked as a journalist and wrote articles on crime and rehabilitation, further enhancing his public image. However, beneath his charismatic persona, he harbored a dark and violent side. He began to commit heinous crimes again, committing a series of brutal killings that mirrored the style of his previous ones. Despite the gruesome nature of his crimes, Johann managed to evade suspicion for some time. He capitalized on his media connections to shape public opinion and divert attention from himself. However, his luck ran out when evidence linking him to the crimes started to mount. In 1992, he was arrested in Miami, Florida after being tracked down by Austrian and American authorities. He was extradited to Austria to stand trial for the killings of 11 women. The high-profile trial captivated the nation and received significant media coverage within Austria. The evidence against him was overwhelming, including witness testimonies, forensic evidence, and his own confessions. He was convicted and sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. On June 29, 1994, Johann was found deceased in his prison cell, and it was later determined that he had taken his own life. In our number 8 spot today, we have Anthony Sowell. Anthony Sowell was a notorious serial killer whose crimes shocked the city of Cleveland, Ohio from 2007 to 2009. Born on August 19, 1959 in East Cleveland, Sowell's criminal activities targeted vulnerable women, specifically those struggling with addiction and those involved in sex work. Sowell's crimes took place in and around his residence on Imperial Avenue, a seemingly ordinary house that hid a horrifying secret. He would lure his victims to his home under the pretense of offering them something to feed their addictions or shelter. Once inside, his horrifying crimes would unfold. The bodies of his victims were often hidden throughout the house, concealed in various locations, including crawl spaces and buried in the backyard. While these crimes were taking place, the local community was largely unaware of the extent of the crimes occurring in their midst. The victims, many of whom were marginalized and leading transient lives, were often overlooked by society. In October 2009, a courageous survivor managed to escape from Sowell's house and alerted the authorities. When the police executed a search warrant on Sowell's property, they made the horrifying discovery of decomposing bodies leading to his immediate arrest. The case of Anthony Sowell garnered significant attention within the Cleveland community, where the shock and horror of the crimes reverberated. Local media covered the story extensively, focusing on the heinous nature of the crimes and the impact on the victims' families. However, the case did not receive as much national or international coverage as some other high-profile serial killer cases. During Sowell's trial, the prosecution presented a compelling case against him, supported by physical 
physical evidence, DNA matches, and the testimonies of survivors. In 2011, he was found guilty on 82 counts and was sentenced to death. In our number 7 spot today, we have Maury Travis. Maury Travis was an American serial killer who terrorized the St. Louis, Missouri area in the early 2000s. His heinous crimes targeted several women and he infamously recorded some of the crimes on videotape. In the early 2000s, Travis began a spree of violence that would claim the lives of multiple women, leaving a community on edge and law enforcement agencies frantically searching for answers. It is said that Travis would often lure the young women he targeted either to secluded areas or sometimes even to his own home. Despite the gravity of his actions, Maury Travis' case did not attract widespread media attention beyond the local region. However, the local community was acutely aware of the terror that Travis had unleashed upon their city. Law enforcement agencies diligently investigated the killings, piecing together evidence and connecting the dots to build a case against him. Ultimately, it was the discovery of Travis's collection of graphic and disturbing videos that provided critical evidence linking him to the crimes. On June 30th, 2002, faced with overwhelming evidence against him, Maury Travis took his own life in his jail cell. His death marked the end of a dark chapter in St. Louis's history, but the scars left by his actions remained. Although Maury Travis's case did not receive extensive media coverage outside of the local region, the impact of his crimes on the St. Louis community cannot be understated. In our number 6 spot today, we have Kendall Francois. Kendall Francois was an American serial killer whose horrific crimes unfolded in the quiet city of Poughkeepsie, New York during the 1990s. Born on July 26, 1971, Francois led a double life, hiding a dark and sinister secret behind his seemingly ordinary facade. Francois specifically targeted women and he would lure them to his home where he subjected them to unspeakable acts of violence and ultimately took their lives. Shockingly, he managed to conceal his crimes by hiding the bodies of his victims within his residence, creating a haunting and gruesome secret that remained undiscovered for an extended period. Despite the disturbing nature of his crimes, Kendall Francois's case did not receive significant media attention at the time. The lack of widespread coverage was due in part to the marginalized nature of his victims. This made it easier for their disappearances to go unnoticed by the broader public. The true extent of his crimes only came to light in 1998 when a routine visit from police officers, prompted by a complaint about a foul odor, led to the shocking discovery of multiple decomposing bodies hidden throughout his home. In total, the remains of eight women were found, exposing the gruesome reality of his actions. Kendall Francois was subsequently arrested and during his trial, the disturbing details of his crimes were revealed. In 2000, he was found guilty on multiple counts and sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. While Kendall Francois's case did not receive the same level of national or international media attention as some other high profile serial killer cases, it serves as a chilling reminder of the hidden dangers that can lurk within seemingly ordinary communities. In our number 5 spot today, we have Belle Gunness. Belle Gunness was a Norwegian American serial killer who is believed to have killed over 40 people, including her own family, in the late 19th century and early 20th century. Belle was born in Norway in 1859 and immigrated to the United States in 1881. She settled in Chicago where she married her first husband and started a family. This was all fine and well until things soon took a turn. Belle began to collect life insurance policies on her family members, and if you're a true crime fan, you likely know where this is going. She then went on to eventually kill them in a fire. She then moved to Laporte, Indiana, where she purchased a farm and continued to lure wealthy suitors to her property just to then kill them for their money and assets. She was known for her physical strength and was able to bury her victims' bodies on her property. Belle's crimes were discovered in 1908 when a fire destroyed her farm and the remains of several of her victims were found. We love when the villain is brought to justice, but unfortunately that did not happen here. Belle herself was never found, and it is believed that she may have faked her own death and fled the country. In our number 4 spot today, we have Charles Schmid. Charles Schmid, infamously known as the Pied Piper of Tucson, was a figure of terror during the 1960s for his involvement in a string of brutal crimes that shook the city of Tucson, Arizona. Operating between 1964 and 1965, Schmid's first victim, Aline Rowe, disappeared in the fall of 1964. Her disappearance sparked concern among her family and friends, but initially received limited attention from the media. As time went on, his violent tendencies escalated and his list of victims grew. The case gained some attention locally due to the disappearances and the growing sense of unease in Tucson. People were disturbed by the disappearances and the realization that a predator was lurking in 
in their midst. It wasn't until one of Schmid's acquaintances came forward with crucial information that law enforcement finally uncovered the extent of his crimes. In 1965, he was arrested and charged with the killings of Aline Rowe, Gretchen Fritz, and Wendy Fritz. The revelation of his dark secrets shocked the community and brought the nation's attention to the grisly acts committed by the Pied Piper of Tucson. During his trial, the disturbing details of his crimes were exposed, with witnesses testifying to his manipulation, his disregard for human life, and the chilling pleasure he derived from his actions. The case captivated the local media, but it did not achieve the same level of national media coverage as some of the era's more high-profile cases, such as the Manson family. Charles Schmid was found guilty of the killings and sentenced to death. However, in 1972, his sentence was commuted to life imprisonment when the death penalty was briefly abolished in the United States. Schmid spent the rest of his life behind bars, becoming a haunting reminder of the evil that can exist within seemingly ordinary individuals. In our number three spot today, we have Charles Albright. Charles Albright, famously known as the Eyeball Killer, was a convicted serial killer whose heinous crimes unfolded in Dallas, Texas during the 1990s. Born on August 10, 1933, Albright appeared to lead a relatively normal life. He grew up in a middle class family, received a good education, and pursued a career in the field of ophthalmology. His chosen profession, specializing in eye care, added a very eerie twist to his later crimes. The hallmark of his crimes was the removal of his victim's eyes, leading to his chilling moniker, the eyeball killer. This disturbing signature left a lasting impression on the local community, instilling fear and disbelief in the hearts of those who heard of his deeds. However, this case did not capture the same level of national or even international attention as some other notorious killers of the time. In 1991, Albright's reign of terror came to an end when he was arrested and charged with taking the lives of three women, Mary Lou Pratt, Susan Peterson, and Shirley Williams. Albright was convicted of his crimes and sentenced to life imprisonment without the possibility of parole, and he remained incarcerated until his death in 2020. In our number two spot today, we have Gary Ray Bowles. Gary Ray Bowles, widely known as the I-95 killer, was an American serial killer who terrorized the southeastern United States during the early 1990s. His specific targeting of gay men along the Interstate 95 corridor left a trail of fear and devastation in his wake. Despite the gravity of his crimes, Bull's case did not garner the same level of attention as some other notorious killers of the era. He began his killing spree in March of 1994, spanning over an intense eight-month period. His MO involved targeting vulnerable gay men, often befriending them and gaining their trust before subjecting them to his crimes. This spree would go on to leave a trail of tragedy and heartbreak in multiple states along the I-95 corridor. Bull's criminal activities finally came to an end in November of 1994 when he was apprehended in Florida. He was subsequently charged with multiple killings and his capture provided a sense of relief and closure to the affected communities. However, the media attention surrounding his arrest and subsequent trial remained relatively contained. During his trial, the disturbing details of his crimes were revealed, shedding light on the extent of his violence and the tragic loss of innocent lives. Gary Ray Bowles was convicted for six killings and received multiple death sentences. He spent years on death row and his case brought attention to the flaws and complexities of the criminal justice system. In 2019, he died of natural causes while awaiting execution, closing a very dark chapter in the history of serial killers in America. And finally, in our number one spot today, we have Cleophas Prince Jr. Cleophas Prince Jr., commonly known as the Claremont Killer, was an American serial killer who operated in the Claremont neighborhood of San Diego, California during the 1990s. Between January and September 1990, Prince embarked on a violent spree targeting and taking the lives of women in the area. Prince would break into their homes or lure them to secluded areas. And while the case did receive attention from local media outlets, the national and international coverage remained relatively limited. Several factors could explain the lack of widespread attention. During the same period, other high-profile serial killer cases, such as those of Jeffrey Dahmer and Ted Bundy, dominated the media landscape, diverting attention away from the Cleophas Prince Jr.'s crimes. Additionally, the demographic profile of Prince's victims may have played a role in the limited coverage. It wasn't until September 1990, after an exhaustive investigation and the implementation of advanced forensic techniques, that Cleophas was finally identified as the Claremont killer. He was arrested and subsequently convicted, ultimately receiving multiple life sentences without the possibility of parole. Number 10. 
Maxim Petrov. Maxim Petrov was convicted for the ending of 11 people's lives in St. Petersburg between 1999 and 2000. Maxim, nicknamed Dr. Death by the Russian media, was a practicing doctor who targeted patients from a local health center, ending their lives by giving them lethal injections at their homes, then robbing them. All victims were included on the same list of lung patients who had undergone fluorography. Using this list, the police identified 72 possible future victims in an operation called Medbrat, male nurse, involving 700 police officers. They arrested Maxim when he visited one of the patients on January 17th in the year 2000. On his arrest, Maxim admitted to the deaths but recanted his confession a few months later, blaming it on the intense psychological pressure he had endured while in custody. Various possessions stolen from the victims were later found in his flat, though he had already sold others at the market. He was suspected of ending the lives of 19 people, but tried for just 17. In 2002, Maxim was found guilty of 11 and was sentenced to life imprisonment. Number 9. Luca Magnata The name Luca Magnata may sound familiar to some. Have you ever seen the Netflix documentary Don't F With Cats? Because if you have, this is where he's from. Luca took the life of Jan Lin, a university student in Montreal, Canada in May 2012. After Luca ended his life, he then began to mail Juan's body parts to schools and federal political party offices. Then a video depicting the crime was posted online and Luca fled Canada, becoming the subject of an Interpol red notice and prompting an international manhunt. In June 2012, he was arrested in an internet cafe in Berlin where he was caught googling himself. He also was previously sought out by animal right groups for uploading videos of himself ending the lives of kittens. In December 2014, after eight days of deliberations, a jury convicted him of his crime and was given a mandatory life sentence and 19 years for other charges to be served concurrently. He is currently at Port Cartier Prison in Quebec. Number 8. Rosemary West Rosemary West collaborated with her husband, Fred West, in the torture and the ending of lives of at least nine women between 1973 and 1987. Rosemary also ended the life of her stepdaughter, Charmaine, in 1971. After police found human remains and apparent signs of torture at 25 Cromwell Street, Rose, along with Fred, were arrested in February 1994. During her trial, Rose denied ending the lives of any of the victims. Rose told the jury that her husband committed the criminal acts alone and she denied participating. In 1995, Rose was sentenced to life in prison while her husband ended his life before going to trial. She was found guilty of all 10 counts and was sentenced to life imprisonment and it was emphasized that she should never be paroled. The Lord Chief Justice later decided that she should spend at least 25 years in prison, but in July 1997, Home Secretary Jack Straw subjected Rose to live out the rest of her life in jail. She's currently being held at HM Prison, New Hall in West Yorkshire. Number 7. Dennis Rader Dennis Rader, aka BTK, an abbreviation he gave himself for bind, torture, and kill, ended the lives of 10 people between the years of 1974 and 1991 in Wichita and Park City, Kansas. He didn't just end lives, but also stalked women, and two women he stalked in the 1980s and one whom he stopped in the mid-1990s filed restraining orders against him. He also sent taunting letters to police and media outlets describing the details of his crimes. By 2004, the investigation of BTK was considered a cold case. Then, after a decade-long hiatus, Dennis initiated a series of 11 communications to the local media. This activity led directly to his arrest in February 2005. He pled guilty and was sentenced in 2005 to 10 life sentences, and though he's eligible for parole, it won't be until he served at least 175 years. He is currently at El Dorado Correctional Facility in Kansas. Number 6. David Berkowitz David Berkowitz, aka Son of Sam, went on a spree of ending lives with his firearm many times in New York that started in July 1976. He ended the lives of six people and wounded seven others by July 1977, terrorizing New Yorkers and gaining worldwide notoriety. David eluded the biggest police manhunt in the city's history while leaving letters that mocked the police and promised future crimes, which were highly publicized by the press. David was arrested on August 10th, 1977 and subsequently indicted for eight crimes that ended lives. He confessed to all of them and initially claimed to have been obeying orders of a demon manifested in the form of a dog belonging to his neighbor, Sam. After being found mentally competent to stand 
in trial, pleaded guilty, and was sentenced to six consecutive life sentences in state prison with the possibility of parole after 25 years. He then admitted that the dog and devil story was a hoax, which is shocking. Intense media coverage of the case made David a celebrity, and he seemed to enjoy it. In response, the New York State legislator enacted new statutes known popularly as Son of Sam laws designed to keep criminals from financially profiting from the publicity created by their crimes. The statutes have remained in law in New York State despite various legal changes, and similar laws have been enacted in several other states. David is currently at Shagum Correctional Facility in New York. Number 5. Charles Cullen Charles Cullen was a nurse who ended the lives of dozens of patients during a 16 year career spanning several New Jersey medical centers until being arrested in 2003. He confessed to committing as many as 40 deaths, at least 29 of which have been confirmed, though through interviews with the police, psychiatrists, and journalists suggest he committed many more, as some experts believe he has up to 400 victims. On March 10, 2006, Charles was brought into the courtroom of Lehigh County President Judge William H. Platt for a sentencing hearing. Charles, upset with the judge, kept repeating, Your Honor, you need to step down for 30 minutes until Judge Platt had Charles gagged with a cloth and duct tape. Even after being gagged, Charles continued to repeat the phrase. In the hearing, Judge Platt gave him an additional six life sentences. As part of his plea agreement, Charles has been working with law enforcement officials to identify additional victims. He was sentenced to 11 life sentences in 2006 and will not be eligible for parole until until 2403. He is currently located at New Jersey State Prison in New Jersey. Number 4. Paul Bernardo Paul Bernardo committed crimes together with his former wife Carla Homoka, who were nicknamed the Ken and Barbie Killers. He is known initially for taking advantage of people in Scarborough, Ontario, a suburb of Toronto, between 1987 and 1990, before ending the lives of three women with Carla. Among those victims was Carla's younger sister, Tammy Homoka. Carla took a plea bargain of 12 years imprisonment and she began giving statements to investigators. She told police that Paul had boasted that he had taken advantage of as many as 30 women, twice as many as the police suspected. This plea bargain caused a lot of outrage and was seen as controversial. Carla was released from prison in 2005 and she settled in Quebec where she married the brother of her lawyer, where she's rumored to still be today. But now after Paul's capture and conviction, he was sentenced to life imprisonment and was later declared a dangerous offender, thus making it unlikely that that he will ever be released from prison. Following his conviction, Paul confessed to taking advantage of 10 more victims, and he is currently being held at Millhaven Institution in Ontario, Canada. Number 3. Joseph James D'Angelo Joseph James D'Angelo, aka the Golden State Killer, was a former police officer who ended the lives of 13 people, took advantage of 50 people, and had been involved in 120, burglar involved in 120 burglaries in California between 1974 and 1980. He is responsible for at least three separate crime sprees throughout the state, each of which spawned a different nickname in the press before it became evident that they were committed by the same person. He was also linked to hundreds of incidents of thefts, burglaries, vandalism, peeping, stalking, and prowling. He wasn't arrested until 2018 though, when DNA tracing from family members on genealogy sites linked him to his crime. In June 2020, he pleaded guilty to 13 deaths and 13 counts of taking advantage of people. In August of that same year, he was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. He's currently serving time at Corican Prison in California. Number 2. Gary Ridgway Gary Ridgway, aka the Green River Killer, was initially convicted of 48 separate deaths. As part of his plea bargain, another conviction was added, bringing the total number of convictions to 49. He ended the lives of women in the US state of Washington during the 1980s and 1990s. Now, most of Gary's victims were alleged to be sex workers and other women in vulnerable circumstances, including runaways. The press gave him his nickname after the first five victims were found in the Green River before his identity was known. He strangled his victims, usually by hand, and after strangling them, he would dump their bodies in forested and overgrown areas in King County, often returning to the bodies to take advantage of them. On November 30th, 2001, Gary was arrested for the deaths of four women whose cases were linked to him through DNA profiling evidence. As part of a plea bargain wherein 
he agreed to disclose the location of still missing women, he was spared the death penalty. He was sentenced to 48 life sentences with no possibility of parole, an additional life sentence, and 480 more years of tampering with evidence. He is currently at Washington State Penitentiary in Washington State. And coming in at number one is Robert Pickton. Robert Pickton worked full time at his family's pig farm after inheriting it in the early 1980s. It was at this point that it was believed he started ending people's lives. He ended their lives just like they were pigs. When he was done with their bodies, he would then feed them to his pigs to get rid of the evidence, which is just messed up. He was finally arrested in 2002 and was convicted in 2007 for the deaths of six women and also the subject of a lengthy investigation that yielded evidence of numerous other deaths. Robert was charged with the deaths of an additional 20 women, many of them from Vancouver's downtown east side, but the charges were stayed by the Crown in 2010. Robert was sentenced to life in prison with no possibility of parole for 25 years, the longest possible sentence for second degree murder under Canadian law at the time he was sentenced. The conviction was appealed twice by his lawyers, but ultimately rejected by Canada's Supreme Court. During the trial's first day of jury evidence, the Crown stated that Robert had confessed to 49 deaths to an undercover agent from the Office of Inspector General who was posing as a cellmate. The Crown reported that he told the officer that he wanted to end the life of another woman to make it an even 50 and that he was caught because he was sloppy. There was actually a two part episode inspired by Robert on the popular crime drama Criminal Minds for the season 4 finale called To Hell and Back. Starting off this list in our number 10 spot we have Joseph Stalin. Stalin was a Georgian revolutionary and Soviet political leader who governed the Soviet Union from 1922 until his death in 1953. Despite the fact that he started his time governing the country as a part of a collective leadership, by the 1930s he had consolidated all of the power and went on to begin acting as the Soviet Union's dictator. During his reign, Stalin was responsible for the deaths of over 60 million people, 20 million of them being his own. Apparently the math works out to be about 40,000 people per week, which is truly unbelievable. For almost 30 years, he reigned the Soviet Union with terror and violence. I mean, his decisions led to a famine that killed millions of people. Also, the lives he took weren't just of his enemies. I mean, how could one person have 60 million enemies? He would take the lives of the families of people he liked. He just took too many lives, he was too paranoid, and while he was powerful and smart, he could also be an absolute monster. This is all perfectly summed up when he said, quote, One death is a tragedy, a million deaths is simply a statistic. In our number 9 spot today we have Pol Pot. Pol Pot was the leader of the Cambodian revolutionary group called the Khmer Rogue. And this group with him at the forefront went on to try and destroy Cambodian civilization. This wasn't necessarily how the group started out, but once Paul and others who shared his ideals came to lead it, things quickly became dark. He is likely one of the only people who ordered a mass genocide in his own country. The reasoning behind all of this is because he believed that destroying the civilization was the best way to start a new regime and bring in a new age. He ended up serving as the Prime Minister from 1976 until 1979, during which his policies led to the deaths of around 2 million people, which is absolutely horrifying. That was about 25% of the entire population. He even liked to keep the skulls of those he had killed. Just gonna say it, it seems as though politics was the mask for someone who just really wanted to kill. There are so many horrific details surrounding him and the things he did, some of which I can't even repeat here on YouTube. YouTube, and that is exactly how he landed a spot here on today's list. He truly did some horrendous things and in the end went on to live the rest of his life and died of natural causes before he could answer for any of his crimes. In our number 8 spot today we have Heinrich Himmler. Alright, so this is one real piece of work who was very active on what we'll call the bad team during World War II. He's actually one of those people who really helped to create and build the Holocaust. He was the head of the SS and he controlled concentration camps and you want to know what he was best known for? his organizational skills and for picking the best subordinate. Yeah, they liked him because he was able to pick the other best worst people ever to work with him. Absolutely insane. They say opposites attract, but in this case it was just terrible people joining other terrible people. He believed that certain groups of people, like Jewish people, were unworthy of living, and he himself ordered the deaths of 6 million. It is completely unimaginable just how evil this person really was. This hasn't exactly been verified, but it's something that has been said for years years, and that is that he had furniture made from the skins and bones of these people. In the end, because he was nothing but a coward, when things for him and his party started to go south, he tried to have open peace talks with the western allies behind
behind the back of you know who. Of course, he found out and had Himmler dismissed from all of his posts and ordered his arrest. This led Himmler to try and to go into hiding, but he was detained and then arrested by British forces once his identity became known. Make this story even worse, while in custody he took his own life, because of course he didn't want to answer for his terrible actions. In our number 7 spot today we have Charles Cullen. This guy used to be a nurse who took the lives of his patients throughout his career, and he may be one of the worst serial killers ever recorded. He confessed to taking the lives of 40 people, but through subsequent interviews, it became apparent that the number was way higher than 40, he just couldn't remember the names of them all. But he could, of course, remember the details of his crimes against them. His crimes started in 1988 and spanned over a decade into 2003. In October of 2003, when a patient at a hospital passed away from low blood sugar, the authorities were called. This person was Charles' final victim, and authorities began looking into him and investigating his past employment history. On December 12th, 2003, authorities were arresting him and charging him with only one count of his crime, but he ended up admitting to 40. He ended up pleading guilty to his crimes and arranged a plea deal where authorities would not seek the death penalty if he cooperated. During one of his court proceedings, he continuously asked the judge to step down and apparently repeatedly chanted, Your Honor, you need to step down for 25 minutes, even after he was restrained and gagged for his outbursts. It is thought that his victims might be up in the 400 range, which is truly unbelievable. And Charles was sentenced to 18 consecutive life sentences and will be eligible for parole in the year 2403. I don't think he's gonna get it. In our number six spot today, we have Leopold II. As the king of the Belgians, Leopold has been set to be responsible for the deaths of somewhere between 2 to 15 million people. It wasn't in Belgium that he committed his atrocious acts, however. It all started when he claimed himself to be the founder and sole owner of the Congo Free State, which was a private project he undertook on his own. Leopold loved colonialism, he wanted to colonize anything he possibly could, and this is why he started the International African Society, which he used to travel to Africa, claim land that obviously wasn't his, and we're not talking about a small piece, we're talking about land that is several times the size of Belgium and many countries just let him do this, and allowed him freely rule this land. This is definitely already bad enough, but of course, things only got worse. Leopold had his own private militia that he used to force the indigenous population into hard labor. While Leopold was doing this, of course, for economic reasons, he was also doing this because he was just a messed up guy. He was terrible. He made those who lived here harvest and process rubber, and the punishments for those who didn't harvest enough for him were extremely severe. Not to mention, it is also said that sometimes he would inflict harm just because he could. Eventually a stop needed to be put to his wrongdoings, but of course, he was going to do everything he could to hide some of the horrors he did. The entire archive of the Congo Free State was burned, and he told his aide that even though the Congo had been taken from him, quote, they have no right to know what I did there. The Congo was taken from him, but remained under the rule of Belgium in 1908, until the Congo was given independence in 1960. As for Leopold, well, he remained the ruler of Belgium until his death in 1909, but the secret was out now and no one liked it. In fact, his funeral cortege was booed by the crowd because everyone was angry at him for the things that he had done. In our number 5 spot today, we have Nero. This one we are taking it all the way back to the age of the Roman Empire. When we think back to these times, they weren't necessarily the most kind, peaceful of times, but there certainly are some characters that stand out as being particularly brutal, and one of those is Nero. Throughout his reign, he wreaked havoc on the Roman Empire, burned cities, he killed thousands of people, including every member of his own family. I mean, we know the inventive execution methods of the past, so you can probably guess at just how brutal these all were. Most Roman sources give us an almost completely negative review of him in reference to both his personality and his reign as a leader. He was called compulsive and corrupt, and it is believed that he is actually to blame for the great fire that burned Rome, but instead he used the Christians as a scapegoat so that they would receive punishments rather than him. In the end, after being declared a public enemy by the Roman Senate and realizing that the rebellion would be lost, he ended up taking his own life at the age of 30. In our number 4 spot today, we have Randy Kraft. Also known as the scorecard killer, Randy is a monster who took the lives of at least 16 young men between 1972 and 1983. The scorecard nickname comes from how, after his arrest, police found a coded list that contained cryptic references to his crimes and the victims. On May 14, 1983, two California Highway Patrol officers observed a car driving erratically and suspected that the driver may be impaired, so they pulled it over. Once the car pulled over, Randy Kraft got out and identified himself and subsequently 
subsequently failed all field sobriety tests. At the same time, the other officer went over to the passenger side where he sadly found Randy's final victim, 25 year old Marine Terry Lee Gambrel. The next two days of investigation revealed the horrors of what Kraft had done, and on May 16th, 1983, he was formally charged with the one crime, but many more charges came in the next months. His trial first began on September 26, 1988, and on August 11th, 1989, the jury rendered a verdict of death and the sentence was upheld. As of this year, he still remains on death row at San Quentin State Prison, where he continues to deny any responsibility for the crimes. Like they didn't find one of the victims in the passenger seat of his car. In our number three spot today, we have Arthur Shawcross. This man is also known as the Genesee River Killer, and his crime spree began in 1972. In trying to navigate these online guidelines, I can't exactly say who he specifically targeted, but what I will say is that while everyone on this list is particularly horrible, Arthur's crimes were some of the worst, if you catch my drift. This story, however, is a little unlike some of the others today, because after the first two of his crimes, he was apprehended, but for some insane reason, they allowed him to have a plea bargain where he was allowed to plead guilty to just one charge of only manslaughter for which he served 14 years years of his 25 year sentence. In the least surprising turn of events, once he was released on early probation, his real crime spree got started. He would go on to take the lives of 12 women from 1988 to 1989. Thankfully, he was finally caught for these crimes and sent right back to prison. Of course, his initial early release was the subject of huge controversy, rightfully so, and Dr. Michael H. Stone, professor of psychiatry at Columbia University, called this early release, quote, one of the most egregious examples of the un warranted release of a prisoner. In the end, Arthur passed away in prison while serving a 250 year sentence. He passed in 2008 after suffering a heart attack. In our number two spot today, we have Ivan the Fourth, more commonly known as Ivan the Terrible. He was the son of Vasily the Third, who was the Rurikid ruler of the Grand Duchy of Moscow. After his father's death, however, at just three years old, Ivan was named the Grand Prince, and by the time he was 16, he was declared as Tsar or Emperor of Russia, officially establishing the Tsardom of Russia. Ivan and his reign are certainly known for the transformation of Russia from a medieval state to an empire, but not without a huge cost to the people of Russia, as well as a hit to the long-term economy. Ivan has been described as being intelligent and devout, but also prone to paranoia, rage, and episodic outbreaks of mental instability that only increased the older he got. One of the main points of extreme violence and viciousness was the massacre of Novgorod, which saw the deaths of an estimated 2,000 to 15,000 people, as well as a shocking amount of acts of extreme, violent cruelty. In the later years, like I mentioned, his violent tendencies only got worse, which led to him doing things like striking his heir in the heat of an argument so badly it left him with brain damage. In the end, Ivan the Terrible met his demise from a heart attack in 1584. Yeah, they say that impaling hundreds of people every day isn't great for the heart health. Finally, in our number one spot today, we have Charles Manson. I will start the story of Charles Manson with when he was released from prison in 1967. After his release, he then moved to San Francisco where he gained a small following that would eventually go on to be the cult known as The Family. The group eventually moved to an abandoned ranch outside of Los Angeles and it was here that Manson continued to brainwash his followers and manipulate them with his own religious philosophies. Manson claimed that there would be an upcoming race war in which white people would be killed, which was intended to instill fear in followers. This was so that he could ignite a race war and sent his followers on a killing spree, which ended up being the night of the horrible Tate and LaBianca killing. This led to a reign of terror in the Los Angeles area for several months because people just couldn't understand how or why this happened. There is a reason many people know who Charles is and, and how he became one of the most prolific killers in history. He is definitely one of those people who just really didn't have anything good to contribute to society. First up in our number 10 spot, Dan Cooper. Back in 1971, a man who went by the alias Dan Cooper hijacked a commercial plane and no one has ever been able to find him since. According to those involved, shortly after takeoff he handed a note to a flight attendant claiming to have a bomb in his briefcase. He demanded four parachutes and $200,000 in $20 bills, which is the equivalent of like $1.2 million nowadays. Otherwise, he was going to... 
kill everyone on the plane. After the flight landed in Seattle, Cooper released the 36 passengers once authorities provided him with the money and the parachutes. But he kept both pilots, one flight attendant, and one flight engineer as hostages on the plane. From there, he forced them to fly to Mexico City, but somewhere over Nevada, Cooper jumped off the plane with the stolen cash. The FBI launched a massive search that is still considered one of the longest and most exhaustive investigations in FBI history. But have yet to find him. And although he isn't on the top 10 list anymore, he is still considered a wanted fugitive. Before we dive into the next 9 points in today's video, I just want to give a huge shout out to today's sponsor, Raid Shadow Legends. Man oh man is this game blowing up everywhere, and for good reason too. It's quite literally the first phone game that delivers the same high quality experience you get on a console, plus it's completely free. Free. Raid has endless content so you'll never get bored. With over 650 unique champions to collect, it's hard to narrow it down to my faves, but I'm going to try for you today. First up, I picked Tuhawk the Wanderer. This beast is a void affinity epic from the orc faction, and not only can he hit hard, but he attacks enemies two times and can also decrease the speed of your enemies. So what's new this month? Well, speaking of champions, Raid is running an extra special legendary champion based off of MMA and pro legend Ronda Rousey that you can get for free whether you are a new or longtime player. All you have to do is log into Raid and play for 7 days between now and February 20th and Ronda will be all yours. To celebrate Ronda's arrival you can also use this special promo code RAIDRONDA to get a bunch of helpful stuff like a 3 day 100% XP boost, 500,000 silver and even 5 full energy refills. I mean the perks just keep coming. But wait there's more! As it is this season after all. Raid has prepared an extra special 12 days of Raid for new players this Christmas. Just download Raid Shadow Legend from the link below and head over to 12daysofraid.plarium.com between now and January 10th to get started. From there you'll enter your player ID and set out on a festive 12 day adventure where each day you'll get to experience a new chapter and play a new mini game for a chance to win amazing in game and real life prizes like holiday themed raid championships and even Amazon gift cards worth up to a thousand bucks. And existing raid players, I know what you're thinking. Where are your prizes? But don't you worry, I've got you covered. Just head over to 12daysofraid.playroom.com and you can find a special holiday promo code that everyone can use for a festive gift. If you haven't started playing raid yet, what are you waiting for? You can click the link in the description below or scan my QR code here on the screen to get unique bonuses worth $30. We're talking a free epic champion Aina, 200,000 silver, one energy refill, and one XP boost, and one ancient shard so you can summon awesome champions as soon as you get in the game. And all this treasure will be waiting for you right now. Here. Coming in at number 9, Route 29 Stalker. One cursed area in the state of Virginia, known as Route 29, has unfortunately become notorious due to the number of women who have seemingly vanished there. The first victim of Larry Breeden, or at least that was his alias, was a woman named Alicia Reynolds. She had been seen driving down Route 29 to go shopping with her mother in a nearby town, but never arrived at the mall. Shortly after, a another 20 or so women came forward to tell the cops that a creep had tried approaching them, trying to get them to pull over their cars on the country road, attempting to convince them that something was wrong with their cars and that he wanted to help. Shortly after, three more women were found dead on the road, then after a strange 13 year gap in crimes, another five women disappeared between 2009 and 2014. To this day, the case of the Route 29 stalker has never been solved, and while there have been a few suspects over the years, no one has been convicted for the crimes. Whoever hurt these women walks free and authorities are still on the hunt for the perp. Next up at number 8, Badresh Kumar Patel. Wanted by the FBI since 2015, Patel could be hiding anywhere. His arrest came, as I said, back in 2015 when he was charged for taking his wife's life. Allegedly the perp struck her multiple times with a kitchen utensil while the two were working at a donut 
donut shop, and then cameras caught him fleeing the scene after the incident. His charges are currently first and second degree first and second degree assault and a dangerous weapon with intent to injure. The FBI has reason to believe he's fled the country as apparently his visa expired right before he killed his wife and there is currently a $100,000 price on his head for anyone with information to his whereabouts. Let's just hope they find him soon. Coming in at number 7, Arnaldo Jimenez. Most people have a romantic honeymoon, at least that's sort of the assumption. But Mr. Arnaldo Jimenez here seemed to have a different plan in mind. Back in 2012, the day after marrying his wife, who, to make matters worse, he already had a family with, Jimenez took her out with some friends to a club. Apparently the couple left around 4am from the club and from there, for whatever reason, Jimenez took her life. His wife was stabbed to death in the back of his car before being dragged into the bathroom tub of her apartment and abandoned. Obviously this creep was charged and a warrant went out for his arrest and although authorities have reason to believe he may have fled back to Mexico, they haven't actually been able to track him down. To this day, he remains on the FBI's most wanted with a $100,000 reward for his capture. Next up at number 6, Ruha Ignatova. Maybe it's just me, but a lot of the time when you hear con artists, you tend to think like a slimy person preying on the old and vulnerable through some weird email contest or something. But Ignatova had a different kind of clientele base she was looking to rip off. Investors. Currently wanted for participation in a large scale fraud scheme that involved her defrauding billions of dollars from investors all over the world, Ignatova began her Ponzi scheme back in 2014. It all started with her MLM called Bigcoin, but from there she moved on to bigger names with deeper pockets. In 2014, she founded OneCoin Limited, which was a Bulgaria-based company that marketed cryptocurrency. But behind the scenes, she was making false statements about the company in order to solicit investments. Later in 2019, her brother came forward admitting it was a money laundering front, but by then Ignatova had already disappeared. Allegedly during its active years, OneCoin is believed to have defrauded victims out of more than $4 billion. Dollars. And not only is she on the FBI's most wanted, but she made her way onto the Interpol's most wanted and has a price on her head for anyone with more information. Coming in at number 5, Alejandro Castillo. Once again, another one of the FBI's most wanted, this criminal has been hiding out since 2016. Six years ago, Castillo texted his co-worker Sandy Lee, who apparently he had briefly dated prior, saying that he wanted to repay her the money she had loaned him. So under the guise of getting her money back, Lee agreed to meet up with him. But here's where it gets twisty. Castillo had a new girlfriend at the time named Amia Feaster, and the afternoon of the incident, he was picked up by her and she drove the pair to the meetup. Although the full details of the crimes aren't confirmed, it's believed Castillo, instead of giving Lee her money back, held her at gunpoint while forcing her to withdraw all the money she had from a nearby ATM, which was about $1,000. Investigators think Castillo then drove Lee into the woods and took her life before dumping the body into a ravine. From there, Castillo and his current girlfriend, Feaster, fled in his Toyota Corolla to Mexico. Since then, he hasn't been seen, but his girlfriend turned herself in in 2016, confirming they'd been living with Castillo's cousins when they were in hiding. The FBI hasn't been able to track him down just yet, but they do think he remains in Mexico to this day. Jose Rodolfo Virial Hernandez, also sometimes referred to as El Gato, this criminal is one of the newer additions to the FBI's most wanted list, having been just added two years ago in 2020. But he may be one of the scarier ones yet. A warrant for his arrest was issued back in June of 2018 when El Gato was accused of having involvement with interstate stalking as well as hiring two men to assassinate a man named Guerrero back in 2013. Allegedly, the two men hired to track down Guerrero and his wife attempted to shoot them down. Guerrero, unfortunately, did not make it past the attack, but luckily his wife escaped unharmed. The craziest part of all of this is that allegedly, Guerrero's sister, after the attack, took revenge on El Gato by having one of his relatives beheaded, which to me sounds like they might have paid off the wrong people. Currently, the FBI is not sure exactly where El Gato is hiding, but the search continues with a million dollars being the price for anyone who's able to track him down. Next up at 
at number three, Eugene K. Palmer. Back in 2012, Eugene Palmer was the neighbor to his son and daughter-in-law, John and Tammy Palmer. Now, not only was Eugene their neighbor, but he also owned the property that the couple and their family lived on. After some time together, John and Tammy's relationship started to go south. And after the pair separated and began seeing other people, Tammy issued a restraining order against her ex, John. On top of the restraining order, Tammy threatened divorce and to sue for the land belonging to Eugene. And all of this began quite the feud between the two. A few days later, Tammy and Eugene had a very heated argument, and then on September 24th, 2012, Eugene took her life. Allegedly, he shot her three times before fleeing the scene in his pickup truck, which was later found abandoned near a park. Now, Eugene was quite the woodsman, so it's believed he fled into the woods, and despite multiple searches, he has never been found. Coming in at number two, Hazel Leota Head. Back in 1998, under the false name of Deanna Ray, Head conned her way into the heart of an old widower named James Barker. Now, according to the authorities, Head was a drifter who hitchhiked around the country looking for lonely men to latch onto so she could drain their bank accounts before abandoning them high and dry. Charles Barker was a depressed and lonely man after losing his wife, and when he met Deanna, he immediately fell smitten with the con artist. After only days of meeting each other, she moved in, and when his family met her, they had a strange suspicion that something about her wasn't right. After some time, Charles too began to think something with his new girlfriend was off, but he never shared any of the details with his family. Then one day, after not hearing from her father for nearly a week, his daughter called up her aunt, Charles' sister, asking if she could go check up on him and make sure that he was okay. When his sister arrived, she saw that the door was open and she ran inside to find Charles Barker dead, slumped over a bar. Once police arrived, they discovered he'd been dead for five days days, and Hazel, or Deanna as she called herself, was missing along with Charles's car and money. The car was found later at an airport, and after running a background check, it was revealed she had pulled this same stunt 10 times before. She remains missing, but authorities have not stopped trying to track her down and arrest her for good. And last up in our number one spot, Michael James Pratt. Currently on the FBI's top 10 most wanted, there is no doubt in my mind that this monster is the worst on this list. Between approximately 2012 to 2019, Michael Pratt along with a few accomplices was involved in recruiting under girls to be a part of an adult film production company that he owned and operated. Pratt lured the girls under a Craigslist ad asking for models and from there he promised payment in exchange for a clothed modeling gig. But sadly this couldn't have been further from what he had planned for the victims. Beyond the obviously morally despicable stuff they were making these minors do, he would also force past victims into providing false assurance to the girls that their films would never end up online. Allegedly, some of the victims were not permitted to leave shooting locations until the shoot was complete. Others were forced to perform after declining participation, and the crew was known to commit SA when the girls wouldn't comply. After fleeing the country in 2019, right before his trial for his crimes, he was added to the FBI list, and the search for this creep continues. Starting off this list in our number 10 spot, we have Scott Erskine. We are starting off this list with truly one of the worst people I've ever heard about. Scott's story starts off when he was a child and suffered an injury that involved his head and brain. He seemed to recover fine physically, but continued to complain of headaches and that sort of thing, and it is unclear if these things were ever looked into further. At a very young age, he began to commit violent crimes against others that I truly cannot even speak about here on YouTube. He spent four years in prison for one of his crimes when he was around 17 years old, but when he was paroled after the four years, he immediately began committing crimes again. In 1993, Scott invited a woman who was waiting for the bus into his home and ended up holding her hostage for several days. After letting her go, he was quickly arrested and ended up being sentenced to 70 years in prison. This is when he had to submit DNA to a database, and in March of 2001, the DNA was matched when the cold cases of the unsolved murder 
murders of Jonathan Sellers and Charlie Kiever were reopened. In 2004, a jury sentenced him to death, and six days later, he was transferred to San Quentin. In an interesting turn of events, Scott did die on death row, but it wasn't due to a scheduled execution. Scott died a couple years ago in July of 2020 after contracting COVID-19. In our number 9 spot today, we have Dennis BTK Raider. The BTK killer, whose real name is Dennis Raider, was one of the worst serial killers from 1974 to 1991. He left taunting letters to police and newspapers where he described his crimes, but thankfully his annoyingly large and misplaced ego is what led to his demise. Because he craved the attention so badly, in 2004 he started communicating with the media again to try and be all smug or whatever, but this combined with his utter lack of knowledge on how technology works, led to him being arrested in 2005. Imagine getting away with those crimes for so long and your ego and your own ignorance does you in in the end. During his trial, he didn't apologize for his crimes, but he did describe them in full detail, which is horrifying and honestly very unnerving. After his trial, he ended up being sentenced to 10 consecutive life sentences with a minimum of 175 years. When Raider was first arrested and police were taking him to the station, an officer asked him, Mr. Raider, do you know why you're going downtown? To which he replied, oh, I have suspicions why. Ew. In our number 8 spot today, we have Chester Turner. Chester is an American serial killer who, on April 30th, 2007, was convicted of taking the lives of 11 women in the Los Angeles area, and on June 19th, 2014, he was convicted of four more that they were able to tie back to him. He has been referred to by prosecutors as one of the most prolific serial killers in the city's history, and if you know Los Angeles' history with things like that, that is not something to take lightly. In his original trial that led to conviction, Chester was sentenced to death, but at the following one in 2014, he also received an additional death sentence. In the end, like with a lot of these kinds of stories, DNA came to save the day and help authorities find out who was committing these horrible, horrible crimes. In our number 7 spot today, we have Gary Ridgway. This horrible human being is also sometimes known as the Green River Killer, and his crimes took place somewhere between 1982 to potentially as recent as 2001. He was convicted of 49 crimes but confessed to an unbelievable 71, which makes him the second most prolific serial killer in the United States in terms of confirmed killings. Most of his victims were either sex workers or women in other vulnerable circumstances, and through DNA profiling evidence, in 2001, authorities were able to connect him to four of his crimes. From there, they made a deal with him where they would spare him the death sentence in exchange for disclosure of the location of all of the missing women. Gary took the deal and was spared the death sentence and instead was sentenced to life without the possibility of parole. Not only did he say that he chose the type of victims he did because they were quote, easy to pick, and that he quote, hated most of them, but he also called his crimes his career. I hate him. In our number 6 spot today we have Charles N.G. Charles' story really starts off shortly after he moved to the United States on a student visa. He dropped out after his first semester and soon after he was involved in a hit and run accident. He then tried to avoid prosecution by enlisting in the United States Marine Corps using false documents that stated his birthplace was within the United States. He was arrested by military police a year later for stealing automatic weapons and then somehow he escaped custody, headed back towards Northern California, and this is where he met Leonard Lake, who is another real piece of work. Charles did end up going away and serving a bit of time, but it was only 18 months and then he was back with Leonard, and that is when the two started their crime spree together. It is believed that together the pair took the lives of somewhere from 11 to 25 different people. When Leonard was caught and brought in for questioning, he sneakily took a cyanide pill he had hidden in his jacket and took his own life, but Charles ended up standing trial. He was convicted for 11 of the killings and he remains on death row at San Quentin. In our number 5 spot today, we have Robert picked in. This horrible person is one of the worst Canadians to ever live and is one of our country's worst serial killers ever. Picton dropped out of school and began working at his family's pig farm, and this is where most of his absolutely horrific crimes took place. He was first arrested in 2002 and was convicted in 2007 of taking the lives of six people, but throughout an extremely lengthy investigation, evidence of many more killings came to light. During his time in jail, an undercover police officer posed as his cellmate and Picton confessed to 49 crimes to him. Apparently, he was saying to the undercover officer that he wanted to take one more life to make it an even 
50, and that he only got caught because he was sloppy. The entire trial was a bit of a mess, but it led to a life sentence without the possibility of parole for 25 years, which was the longest possible sentence under Canadian law at the time. This unfortunately does mean that he will be eligible for parole within the next decade, so let's hope that never ever happens. In our number 4 spot today we have the Golden State Killer. The Golden State Killer is one of the most well-known serial killers ever, and that is never a good thing. From 1973 to 1986, the GSK was responsible for taking the lives of 13 people, harming 50, and 120 different burglaries all across California. Throughout the investigation process, he used different tactics to both taunt and threaten police and the victims, which is just on a whole other disgusting level. Through recent genetic testing, like those 23andMe things, the identity of the GSK was finally revealed after years and years of investigations. Basically, they uploaded a DNA profile that they were able to get from the crime scenes to the website GED Match. They were able to find 10 to 20 people who had the same great, great, great grandparents as a match. And then from there, the genealogist made a large family tree, and from there, they were then able to single out two main suspects. After covertly collecting DNA samples from one of the suspects and comparing them with the crime scene DNA, they were finally able to arrest Joseph. James D'Angelo, who is the Golden State Killer. After decades of waiting, the victims of his crimes were finally able to see justice served as he was sentenced to 12 life sentences plus eight years. He was spared the death penalty because he admitted to numerous crimes that he had perpetrated, some of which he wasn't even being charged for. He is now 75 years old and will definitely spend the rest of his life in prison. In our number three spot today, we have Rodney Alaka. Rodney is a horrible monster who was convicted and sentenced to death for five killings that he committed in California from 1977 to 1979. He also received an additional 25 years to life after pleading guilty to two other other killings in New York from 1971 to 1977. Rodney got away with his crimes for a while because he wasn't the top of the list of suspects because he was said to be the quote charming photographer. Rodney is often referred to as the dating game killer because of his appearance on the show which with what we now know about him is absolutely horrifying. What's even crazier is that he actually won the show he was on but the episode's bachelorette refused to go on a date with him because she found him quote creepy. This is just a reminder to always trust your instincts. It isn't exactly known just how many victims Rodney had. It is potentially thought that it could be much higher than the number he was convicted for. In July of last year, Rodney passed away in prison at the age of 77. In our number two spot today, we have the Zodiac Killer. This one had to make it on this list today because while there are a plethora of terrifying people on this list, nothing is as terrifying as an uncaught serial killer, and the Zodiac is definitely the most prolific of them all. The Zodiac Killer took the lives of five people in the San Francisco Bay Area between December 1968 and October 1969. He was most known for targeting young couples or a lone male cab driver. Despite two people luckily and thankfully escaping his attempted evil doings, he he has still never been caught. He was one of those losers who left notes and stuff for the police to find. I like that they think they're being all cool and clever and brave while they do that. Like if you're so brave and almighty and unafraid, then show us your face. While no one has heard from the Zodiac since 1974, the case remains active in many different countries and maybe one day we'll finally know who the real Zodiac is. In our number one spot today, we have Robert Hansen. Robert is often referred to as the Butcher Baker, and his story truly is horrific. He is one of the most prolific serial killers in Alaska's history because, for over a decade, he would kidnap women and bring them into the wilderness where he would then stalk them like prey. I am just now realizing that there is definitely an episode of Criminal Minds about this guy. Sometimes the premise is just so dark that it sticks with you. The reason he got away with his crimes for so long is because outside of these horrific things, he was just a soft-spoken baker. One of my best friends has the nicest, most kind bakers for parents, and now I'm starting to feel a little suspicious. Might want to look into them, Robin. 
Robert was heading to church by day and prowling strip clubs at night looking for the next person to take. What led to the downfall of this horrible monster was a badass named Cindy Paulson who was able to escape from Robert and was sure to leave evidence behind. She then went to authorities and told them what happened and this led to a search warrant for Robert's property, which is where all the evidence they needed lied. Robert is believed to have taken the lives of at least 17 women and in 1983 he was sentenced to 461 years and a life sentence without the possibility of parole. That being said, number 10 is Jeffrey. Dahmer. Now you knew that we would be talking about this when you clicked on this video. Dahmer, Monster the Jeffrey Dahmer story is blowing up right now. Its first episode has some people so tense and terrified they could not even continue watching. Unlike a lot of cinematic tellings of serial killer stories, Dahmer puts you on the outside and in the point of view of the victims of this incredibly ruthless killer. It really makes you feel for just how tragic the whole thing really was, connecting you to the victims before they are snatched away, essentially making you hate this incredible incredibly deranged man, not to mention making you feel the sense of dread and the horror that being around this monster instilled in those involved. Number 9. The Public this one is more interesting because while the story does follow a real homicide case, the falsely accused Amanda Knox is where it is focused. While on a foreign exchange trip from the United States to Perugia, Italy, Amanda Knox, a college student, was accused of brutally taking the life of her roommate, Meredith Kircher. Knox became a media sensation in all the worst ways, with tabloids painting her as evil and twisted while she served almost four years in an Italian prison before Italy's highest court exonerated her in 2015. The Netflix documentary surrounding her shows the truth of Meredith's passing while also exposing just how the public's reaction to what the media fed them caused Amanda to be treated like a monster. If you guys are finding any of this interesting so far, even in the slightest, make sure to hit that like button. It really helps us gauge exactly what kind of content you guys want to see. And in at number 8 is Larry Nassar. Not all monsters end people's lives. The Netflix documentary Athlete A follows a team of investigative journalists from the Indianapolis Star who broke the story of USA Gymnastic doctor Larry Nassar, who used his employment as the team's doctor to exploit, deceive, and violate hundreds of young women. The documentary also follows the survivors of the doctor's horrible ways. The interviews with the athletes as well as the journalists who exposed it all also shines a light on just how the USAG covered up Larry Nassar's actions for years. Number 7. Luke Magnata If you guys are a fan of true crime documentaries, then I would be surprised if you had never heard of Don't F With Cats. Basically, back in 2010, an incredibly disturbing video of a man taking the life of two kittens emerged online, causing quite a bit of grief for the people who saw it. But it was not the last video to emerge. As the crimes committed in the videos escalated, beginning to include actual people, a group of individuals online formed together to track down just who exactly the man in the video was. After a ton of very intuitive internet sleuthing, their manhunt led them and the police to Luke Magnota, who was later convicted for taking the life of Chinese international student Zhen Lin in disturbing circumstances in 2012. But just be warned, I'm serious when I say the documentary is disturbing. Number 6. Warren Jeffs the docu-series Keep Sweet, Pray, and Obey dives into the Fundamentalist Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, or the FLDS. The FLDS is an extremist offshoot of mainstream Mormonism led by Warren Jeffs. It's revealed that using the ideals of his church, Warren would coerce and force female members of the congregation, most of which were underage, into polyamorous marriage, blind obedience, and extreme isolation from the outside world. He was sentenced to life in prison plus 20 years for violating many of his 482 victims, including his 78 wives. If cults are your true crime thing, this is certainly an interesting watch. It does leave you feeling worried about how something like this could ever actually happen. Number 5. Richard Ramirez Richard Ramirez was a serial killer in San Francisco and the area surrounding it between June 1984 and August 1985. He had a particularly brutal and very chilling MO, which included breaking and entering, which gave him the nicknames of the walk-in killer and the valley intruder. The Netflix documentary Night Stalk 
Stalker, named after his most famous nickname, follows the manhunt and investigation that led to the arrest of this brutal killer and his tragic victims. It's a bone chilling story that will leave you feeling unsafe even while you're sitting in the comfort of your own home. Number four. Roommates. This one is going to be on a very slightly lighter note than most of these other ones, but only slightly, as the stories told in the five part aptly named Worst Roommate Ever series vary from story to story, mostly all told with the help of animation. One story could cover a violent con artist or relentless squatter, while others do indeed include killers and their crimes. And they are all told with a focus on the victims or witnesses who dealt with these truly terrifying roommates. It's all interesting and all injects a jolt of fear that makes you second guess whoever you decide to share your living space with, if you even have the privilege to choose that in the first place. Number 3 Hunter Moore This is a different kind of terrifying. The social kind. The most hated man on the internet takes a victim centric look at Hunter Moore, who founded a revenge website called Is Anyone Up, which stayed active for about 16 months starting in 2010. On the website, people could post exposing and inappropriate pictures of their exes and others without those people's consent, for everyone to see, including information like their names, where they lived, and where they worked, practically inviting harassment. But more in addition to that, also hired a hacker to break into other people's phones and computers to get more and more of their private photos and videos to share on his website. The documentary makes you feel hate more than it makes you feel terrified, but the unsettling thought of having your private life on display like that does make some feel very, very uneasy. Number 2 Yu Young Chul Let's move out of North America and Europe for this one. Yu Young Chul was a serial killer from Seoul, South Korea from 2003 to 2004. His crimes were mostly performed against women and the wealthy, with his first life ending crimes in 2003 being against wealthy senior citizens, staging his crimes as robbery homicides. He would then move on to target masseuses and then ladies of the night. His crimes caused fear to spread throughout the city, and the documentary The Raincoat Killer Chasing a Predator in Korea really gives you the feeling of fear and uncertainty that made this killer such a terrifying figure in South Korea. Number one, various real killers. The last point on this list I want to give to one of my favorite true crime shows on Netflix. It's called Mind Hunter. Now, while the show follows a fictional character named Holden Ford, he is based on John E. Douglas, who redefined homicide investigations thanks to information that he learned from interviews with famous serial killers like David Berkowitz, John Wayne Gacy, Charles Manson, Richard Speck, and Edmund Kemper, all of whom are featured in the show played incredibly well by various really well cast actors. Watching Holden do the same work as an agent in the FBI's behavior sciences unit is a really interesting and sometimes terrifying dive into a world a lot of us just never see. Starting us off at number 10 is Jane Toppin. Likely responsible for nearly 31 deaths, Jane, or Jolly Jane as she's often referred to, had a very unique motive to have more people helpless people than any other man or woman who ever lived. She came from a very abusive household, and after her mother's death, she and her sisters were given up to an orphanage. Now, not much is known about what went on during her time there, but just two years after she was admitted, she was hired as a servant for a family in Massachusetts. As an adult, Jane began studying nursing and was well liked as a hospital, but soon she began fixating on elderly and sick patients and began using them as test subjects for morphine and atrophy injections as she was interested in what it would do to their nervous systems. Upon her arrest, she was coined an angel of death as she reported that she would poison her victims before laying down with them and fondling their helpless bodies until they passed. She said she derived pleasure from the patients on the brink of death and felt as though she could see the inner workings of their souls through their eyes. Although at first her victims were elderly and sick, she began to poison more recklessly friends, family, and even her housekeeper. During trial, she insisted on being declared sane as she wanted the possibility of release, but the jury ruled her unfit for trial and had her committed to an institution where she remained until her death in 1938. Next up at number 9 is Rodney Alcala. During the late 70s, Rodney came into the public eye after appearing on the TV show The Dating Game. But what America didn't know was that he was actually a cold-blooded 
It's kind of wild that he managed to get on the show in the first place because he had already had a pretty hefty criminal history, having already been one of America's most wanted fugitives for several kidnappings of young girls, as well as a few suspected but I guess they just didn't really do much of a background check for the contestants. At the time, fellow contestants thought he was very strange and creepy, but still he won the competition and a date with the bachelorette. However, she too felt something was wrong with him, so refused to go on a date. And authorities believe that was what might have thrown Rodney over the edge. He began kidnapping at a much higher rate, inviting unsuspecting girls and boys to his house to model for him. Once he got them to his house, he would take them into his photo room and force them to take explicit photos before taking advantage of them and ending their lives. Finally, authorities caught on to him and upon his 1979 arrest, they uncovered more than a thousand photographs linking him to a suspected 130 victims. Officially, he was convicted for eight and sentenced to death, but died of natural causes before the day came. Next up at number 8 is Albert Fish. Also known as the Brooklyn Vampire, Albert Fish was a terrifying responsible for the death of three people in the mid-1920s, although according to him, it was well over a hundred. Fish grew up in an unstable home. Both his parents suffered from mental illness, and after his father died, he was sent to live in an orphanage. While there, he was abused by the other orphans, but he started to develop a rather confusing feeling towards the pain. He began to enjoy it. As Fish got older, he started seeking darker and more twisted things to feel alive, and soon that led to the kidnapping taking advantage of and subsequent devouring of Thankfully, the monster was caught in 1935, and shockingly, he wasted no time denying his atrocities. In fact, he almost seemed proud of them. I can't, and frankly, won't go into detail about what he did, but it is some of the most disgusting stuff I've ever read about. Eventually, Fish was sentenced to death and died by electric chair in 1936, and after his death, his lawyer refused to release his statement, saying, I will never show it to anyone. It was the most filthy string of obscenities that I have ever read. Next up at number 7 is Robert Hansen. Known in the media as the Butcher Baker, Hansen was an extremely sick who quite literally viewed his victims as prey. In his adolescence, Robert was an awkward and shy boy who had absolutely no luck with girls. These early rejections festered into a deep hatred for women for which he would later seek revenge. As he got older, he began finding solace in archery and hunting and would routinely spend his time perfecting his craft alone in the woods. Then in the early 1960s, he began seeking revenge, at first by committing arson on his high school property, but then soon turning to seek revenge on women specifically. By 1971, he was kidnapping and taking advantage of women, but not yet. He was charged and sentenced to five years for his crimes, but after just six months was released on a work program. After his release was where it got really scary. He began kidnapping women and escorts, taking them back to his apartment where he would do awful things to their bodies, before flying them out to secluded areas in the wilderness and telling them that he was going to hunt them down and them. Tragically, an estimated 21 women lost their lives to this monster, but thankfully he was convicted and sentenced to 461 years in prison without possibility of parole. Coming in at number 6, we have Henry Lee Lucas. Active between 1960 to 1983, Lucas was a convicted responsible for the death of at least three people, one of which was his own mother. Lucas and his mother had a very relationship. In his early years, she worked as an escort and would force Lucas to watch her in the act, often forcing him to cross as well so she could to her clients. Then in 1949, Lucas's father passed away and shortly after, he dropped out of school and ran away from home. After a stint in prison for burglary, he was released in 1959 before reconnecting with his family. Soon, he was visited by his mother and told her of his new fiance he had met through pen pal while being locked up but his mother didn't approve and wanted him to move back in with her and take care of her. Then, one night in a heated argument, she struck him with a broom before he stabbed her through the neck and fled the scene. Lucas was promptly convicted for the crime and sentenced to 40 years, but after only 10 years away, they released him due to overcrowding. From there, it only got worse. Lucas was a man on the run and started kidnapping and taking advantage of 
at a disgusting rate. One of which was his own daughter, as well as the daughter of fellow convicted felon Otis Toole. Eventually, he was caught for his crimes and sentenced to death after confessing to six. Hundred killings. And although his claim of 600 was never taken to heart, it is likely that the number was very high and no one really knows just how many people he harmed for sure. Coming in at number five, Aldolfo Constanzo. Active during the late 1980s, Aldolfo was a brutal and cult leader responsible for the death of a suspected 26 people. Early on, Adolfo was introduced to voodoo, occult, and palo mayombe, and began to develop an interest in animal sacrifice for ritualistic purposes. Once an adult, he moved to Mexico City, where he started a business performing his sacrifices for clients looking to receive good luck. Many of his clients were involved in high-ranking cartels, and he even began to make friends with corrupt officers. Soon enough, the sacrifice of animals wasn't satiating his needs, and so he began to exhume bodies, thinking that their bones held more power than that of an animal. But soon enough, he and his cult decided that committing human sacrifices would provide even more power, and so the brutality began. The cult 20 people mutilating their bodies for power, but soon even that wasn't enough. Constanzo decided he needed an incredible brain to reach his peak. He ordered his henchmen to abduct a pre-med student named Mark Kilroy, who they brought back, sacrificing him and taking out his brain carefully before adding it to their pile of human sacrifices. Eventually, police got word of the cult and set out to raid the ranch, but Adolfo fled with four of his followers to a nearby apartment. Police tracked him down and Adolfo determined not to go to prison ordered his henchmen to him then themselves before the police could enter the apartment. As Adolfo was dead when they arrived, he was never charged, but 14 of the high ranking cult members were convicted of a range of crimes, most serving upwards of 30 years in prison. Coming in at number four is Gary Ridgway. Gary grew up in a troubled household with very little stability, which led him to wetting his bed well into his teen years. After each incident, his mother would clean him up, which led Gary to have very conflicting feelings of both anger and desire towards his mother, often fantasizing about killing her and then doing unspeakable things to her corpse. When he got older, he joined the military, and although he was married, it was during this time in combat that he started to become obsessed with escorts. Once he returned back to America, his first marriage ended quite quickly after his wife discovered he had given her multiple infections. Soon after he married again, this time finding salvation in the church. He forced his wife into a staunch and devout life, but in contrast, kept his ravenous appetite for inappropriate relations both with his wife and with those whose company he paid for. But Ridgway had an inner conflict about his desires and started strangling the women after he had got what he wanted from them, dumping their brutalized bodies into the woods. Disgustingly, it was later revealed by one of his wives that he would often ask to have relations in the woods at the time. She didn't know why, but during investigations, multiple of his victims were found buried in those woods and authorities believe he got pleasure from being in the area. Upon his arrest, he was officially convicted for taking 49 lives, but during trial, he famously said that he had so many that he'd lost count and that even he didn't know the real number anymore. Thankfully, the monster was sentenced to life in prison with no possibility for parole, where he remains to this day. Coming in at number three is Richard Trenton Chase. Often referred to as the Vampire of Sacramento, Chase was a truly terrifying who took the life of six people in just one month back in 1977. Before he turned to human victims, Chase would capture animals before bringing them back to his apartment to and disembowel. From there, he would eat them raw, sometimes mixing them with Coca Cola in his blender. Then, between 1973 to 76, Chase was forcibly admitted to an institution after being taken to an emergency room for trying to inject rabbit's blood into his veins. While in the facility, he was diagnosed with paranoid schizophrenia and became known as the vampire, as he all too often animals and drank their blood. But by 1976, he was deemed no longer a threat to society and released back into his mother's custody. Tragically, she began weaning him off his medication, believing that he didn't really need it. And once again, he slipped into evil habits. But this time, it wasn't birds and rabbits Chase was harming, it was breaking into homes and 
people before treating them just as he did his animals. Eventually he was put on trial for his six victims and a jury ruled him guilty, rejecting the defense's attempt that he could not be tried due to insanity. Chase was sentenced to death but ended up taking his own life while behind bars before his execution. Coming in at number 2 is Ed Gein. Also known as the Butcher of Plainfield, this monster was a and body snatcher between 1947 to 1957. Gain grew up very religious. His mother was a devout Lutheran who taught her sons that women were inherently promiscuous and instruments of the devil. Gain became very attached to his mother, a little too much, and after his father and brother both died, she was all he had left. Gain became his mother's primary caregiver after she had a stroke, and then when she died in 1945, something snapped. And he became a different person. He began to visit graveyards at night, digging up middle aged women that had similarities to his deceased mother. He'd then bring the bodies home before mutilating them, using their skin to make covers for his furniture, masks out of their faces, or using the bones for decoration and dishes. Even creepier was when he began creating an entire woman suit from various different exhumed bodies as he wanted to be able to become his mother and literally be in her skin. After exhuming dead bodies began to feel dull, he started to kill the victims himself. Two women lost their lives in his hands, both of which were found scattered across his property as furniture pieces, almost as if they were some prized hunting trophy. After his horror house was found by authorities in 1957, he was deemed legally insane and unfit for trial. He spent the rest of his life in an institution for the criminally insane until his death in 1984. And last up today we have Jim Jones. If you've ever heard of the term drinking the Kool-Aid, this man is why. Growing up, Jones's family life was difficult. His father was a disabled war vet, frequently in and out of hospital, and his mother was all around just neglectful. So Jones was pretty much left to his own devices. Looking for a family, he began to develop a community at his local church, but sadly it turned into a much darker obsession. Soon he began to study and idealize fascists and communist leaders and dreamed of becoming a preacher just like them. As an adult, he worked as a minister and began claiming to have psychic powers as well as an ability to heal the wounded and sick until eventually he started his own religion, the People's Temple. Sadly, he became drunk on power and next thing you know, he was calling himself a prophet and began hoarding the cult members money for his own gain. By 1977, he immigrated the community to Guyana to live as a commune called Jonestown. But after Congressman Ryan got hint of what was really going on down there, he went to investigate allegations of human rights abuse. The congressman ended up taking members from the cult who expressed their desire to leave. But Jones did not take kindly to this and ordered his henchmen to Ryan and his party. But after he got word that not everyone was taken out, he became afraid that the military would come down and shut down his entire operation. So he ordered that all members take their own lives as an act of revolution. Tragically, all 909 members, many of which were minors, were forced to take their own life with a mix of flavor aid and cyanide. All those that didn't go down willingly were given an injection. Prior to September of 2001, it was the greatest deliberate loss of American civilian life. Starting off in our number 10 spot, we have Darren Dion Van. Back in 2014, Darren Dion Van was arrested after he was charged with taking the life of a woman. After his arrest, however, the true extent of his crimes would come to light when he suddenly confessed to taking the lives of at least six others that authorities hadn't previously known about. The story of Darren and his arrest starts back in 2009 when he was convicted of a horrible crime in Texas. He served five years for this crime before being released and heading back to his home state of Indiana in July of 2013. Once here is when he committed the horrific crime he would again be arrested for when he took the life of 19 year old Africa Hardy. He left her in a motel room but what he didn't know is that the surveillance cameras caught him and placed him at the scene of the crime, which thankfully led to his arrest. When he was questioned for the crime is when he admitted to the others as well. Of course, investigators were a little skeptical of these claims, but Darren actually went out and was able to lead investigators to the bodies that he had left in abandoned buildings around Gary, Indiana. He of course was charged with all of the crimes, and while he could have received a death sentence, he instead received seven concurrent life sentences, of course without parole. In our number 9 spot today we have Salvatore Perez. 
Crone, also referred to as the Son of Sal. This American serial killer terrorized the streets of Brooklyn for months back in 2012. People were terrified as there was some sort of unidentified killer who was taking the lives of shopkeepers. Basically, this monster was specifically targeting shopkeepers who were of Middle Eastern descent. He would go into the store around closing time when they were alone, and he would use the same sawed off weapon in each attack. In the end, after his months of terror, Salvatore took the lives of Isaac Kader, who was 59, Mohammed Gabelli, who was 65, and Ramatal Vidapur, who was 78. After someone was thankfully able to identify Salvatore based off of a photo that authorities were circulating, they were able to obtain a warrant to search his girlfriend's home. Here, they found a duffel bag that he actually had with him in the photo that was used to identify him, and in the bag were two weapons, and through ballistic and blood testing, experts were able to tie these weapons to the cases. Although Salvatore was never charged with hate crimes, he was charged with the three killings, and after a very tumultuous trial where he continually had outbursts that claimed his innocence, it only took the jury 30 minutes to come back with a conviction. Salvatore was sentenced to the maximum sentence of 75 years to life in prison, but not before Brooklyn Supreme Court Justice Alan Morris said, you're lucky we don't have the death penalty here in New York. You would be a prime candidate. In our number 8 spot today, we have Michael Madison. On July 19th, 2013, police were called to a neighborhood after there were reports of a horrible smell. Unfortunately, this investigation would turn out to yield horrifying results when authorities searched a garage and found a decomposing body inside. The following day, they found two more bodies, one in a backyard and the other in the basement of a house that was sitting vacant. The garage where the first body was found was leased to a man named Michael Madison, and because of this gruesome discovery, police got a warrant and entered his apartment, where it is said that they found, quote, further evidence of decomposition. Of course, authorities quickly took Michael into custody, not without a brief standoff, and they also worked to identify the victims. They found out that they had been Shatisha Sheely, she was 28 years old and had been missing since September of 2012, Angela Deskins, she was 38 and was a resident of Cleveland who was reported missing in June 2013, and finally, Sherelda Helen Terry, who was just 18 and was last seen on July 10th, 2013, leaving a Cleveland elementary school where she had a summer job. On July 22nd, 2013, Michael was charged with the crimes, and he had his bail set at $6 million, and he waived his right to a preliminary hearing. Michael did confess to his crimes, but let's not confuse that for remorse or apologies. When he appeared in court, he taunted and smiled at the families of the victims. In fact, it was so bad that one of the victim's fathers, Van Terry, attacked this monster from the witness stand. In the video, which did go viral, Van said, I guess we're supposed to find it in our hearts to forgive this clown. After which, he appears to have had enough of the smug attitude of this horrifying person, and he just snapped and flew across the courtroom. A move that not a single person could possibly blame him for. In the end, Michael was sentenced to death for his horrific crimes. In our number 7 spot today, we have Lonnie David Franklin Jr. Known as the Grim Sleeper, this serial is believed to have taken the lives of at least 25 women, if not dozens to hundreds more, between the years of 1985 to 2007. He got his nickname from the fact that he took a break from his crimes between 1988 and 2002. There are a lot of details about these crimes and his history that really is too dark for me to talk about here on YouTube, but what I can tell you is the way that this monster got caught. While these killings were stumping detectives for decades, when the LAPD started their cold case unit, it was discovered that the killer of seven women in the 80s was able to be connected through ballistics and DNA to deaths in 2002, 2003, and 2007. This was a really important break in the case, but while they had the DNA, there was no match in CODIS, which is the National DNA Database. Finally, however, when 2010 rolled around, Lonnie was caught because his son was arrested for a completely unrelated crime, and because of this, he had to give a DNA swab. This swab through familial DNA testing finally was the missing puzzle piece and it showed that this son was related to the killer that they were looking for. This is when detectives followed Lonnie into a pizza place. As he finished up his meal, a detective who was posing as a busboy came and collected some items like a fork, plastic cups, a plate, and a pizza slice. A few days later, DNA from these items came back as a match to the DNA found on one of the victims and they were finally able to arrest and charge Lonnie. On August 10th, 2016, the Los Angeles 
Angeles Superior Court sentenced him to death for each of the 10 victims named in the verdict. And on March 28, 2020, Lonnie was found passed away in his cell at San Quentin State Prison. The cause of death has never officially been released. In our number six spot today, we have Ahmad Siraji. This is the name of an Indonesian serial who is responsible for taking the lives of 42 women between 1986 and 1997. Once caught for one crime, he explained to the police that he had a dream in 1986 where his father's ghost told him that if he drank the saliva of 70 women who had passed away, he would become some sort of mystic healer with unbelievable abilities. All of the women whose lives he took, he buried them near his home with their heads facing towards his home because he believed this would give him more power. In this dream, Apparently, his father didn't tell him to kill, but because he thought it would take so long to get the saliva of 70 passed away women, he thought that this would help him speed up the process. The entire process of his crimes was very ritualistic and brutal, and often the victims of these crimes were women who had come to him for help since he was advertising himself as some kind of a sorcerer. Ahmad had three wives who were all sisters, and they too were arrested for assisting in these crimes and for helping him hide the bodies. One of his wives was even tried as his accomplice and was sentenced to death before her sentence was commuted to life in prison. For Ahmad, on the other hand, he too was sentenced to death by the firing squad, but this time it was carried out on July 10th, 2008. In our number 5 spot today, we have Leonardo Ciansuli. Also known as the soap maker of Correggio, Leonardo was an Italian serial killer who lived from 1893 until 1970. Basically, in her youth, Leonardo visited a fortune teller who told her that she was going to have many children, but that they would all pass away before she did. It's very Game of Thrones, and Leonardo definitely decided to take the Lannister way. Leonardo took the lives of three separate people and turned them into soap and tea cakes using caustic soda. Leonardo's son went to join the Italian army in preparation for World War II, and during this time, she figured the only way to protect him was by doing human sacrifices. One of the worst parts of these crimes, aside from, you know, the crime itself, is that she fed these tea cakes that she had made to people who would come to visit, along with eating them herself and feeding them to her son. Authorities caught on to her crimes when one of her victim's family members began to get suspicious about the disappearance. In the end, Leonardo was arrested and charged and ended up being sentenced to 30 years in prison and three years in a criminal asylum. In our number four spot today, we have Vlado Tineski. Vlado was a Macedonian journalist who turned into a serial killer in the hopes of getting a good story. Yep. Absolutely wild. His crimes took place between 2005 and 2008, and it all started because he really wanted a good story, and he knew that a vicious killer on the loose would entice readers more than anything, and with special inside info, who would possibly have a better scoop on the story? This is what led him to these horrific crimes against three, possibly four, elderly women who he took the lives of and then wrote stories about, pretending as if he didn't. Sure enough, his plan did work for a while. People were raving about his reports, but it would be these reports that went on to reveal his true identity and what was really going on. He first came under suspicion after having written the three articles about the killings, and this then led to him being questioned. This is because his articles contained information that actually hadn't yet been released to the public. Like in one instance, his report included that the killer had used a telephone cord, and that this cord had been left behind at the scene. Something that only authorities knew, but hadn't yet made public, so of course, how could he possibly know? Finally, he was arrested on June 20th, 2008, after his DNA was able to be connected to DNA found on one of the victims. Unfortunately, Vladio wouldn't live long enough to stand trial because he decided he couldn't face the consequence of his own actions, and so he took his own life in his prison cell on June 23rd, 2008. In our number three spot today, we have Charles Manson. I'm not entirely sure how we got to part six without talking about Charles Manson, but... Here we are. Manson was released from prison in 1967, where he then moved to San Francisco, and this is where he gained a small following that would eventually go on to be the cult known as The Family. The group eventually moved to an abandoned ranch outside of Los Angeles, and it was here that Manson continued to brainwash his followers and manipulate them with his own religious philosophies. Manson claimed that there would be an upcoming race war in which white people would all be killed, which was intended to instill fear in his followers. This was so that he could ignite a race 
this war and sent his followers on a killing spree, which ended up being the night of the horrible Tate and LaBianca killings. This led to a reign of terror in the Los Angeles area for several months because people just couldn't understand how or why this happened. In our number two spot today, we have Peter Tobin. Peter Tobin is a serial killer who was convicted for three separate crimes, but it is believed his crimes may actually be up in the range of 40 to 50. Before being convicted of these crimes, Peter also served another 10 years in prison for other crimes committed, and he was released from prison for these crimes in 2004. Three years later, however, he was sentenced to life with a minimum of 21 years for taking the life of Angelica Kluck in 2006. After this, remains of two more people who went missing in 1991 were found in his former home, and he was also tried for these crimes, which ended up solidifying his sentence to a whole life order, which means he will never be up for parole. There are some believe Tobin is responsible for more unsolved crimes, and he has been labeled a psychopath by a senior psychologist. Apparently, while in prison, he has boasted about taking the lives of 48 people, despite the fact that he's only officially been linked to three. And finally, in our number one spot today, we have Sam Little. Sam Little is well known for being one of the worst serial killers ever. He has confessed to taking the lives of more than 90 people, and while authorities have only been able to definitively connect him to 30, they say that they have no reason to doubt the validity of any of his other confessions. Sam was able to continue on this horrible path for so many years because of the fact that he committed these crimes in different states and different counties, which made it more difficult to connect his crimes to one another. In an interview with an investigator named Sergeant LeBlanc, as they discussed religious beliefs, they spoke about the nature of sin. Sam stated that he had no fear of God and said that God made him this way, so why should he ask for forgiveness? He said that God knew everything that he did, and he also allegedly told a few select people that he believed that he was the devil. In our number 10 spot, we have Vince Weiguang Li. Vince is a man originally from China and then moved to Canada and officially became a Canadian citizen in 2006. Vince was riding a Greyhound bus in the evening of July. 30th, 2008, when he turned to the person sitting beside him, a man named Tim McLean, and he began to harm him and he proceeded to hold up his head to display to the fellow passengers. He then began to eat Tim, consuming his flesh and most likely his eyes and tongue as they were never found. Tim of course was arrested and went to court and pled not criminally responsible due to insanity. He was put in a high security mental health facility where he resides today. In our number 9 spot we have James Douglas. James Douglas was the third Marquis of Queensbury in Scotland in the early 1700s. A Scottish nobleman, if you will. He was known as being an imbecile, or was called violently insane and was always watched. Apparently in 1707 when the Act of Union was signed, which made the Kingdom of England and Scotland under the same monarchy, there was so much going on that no one actually noticed that James had escaped. He went into the kitchen of his house and took the life of a servant. Apparently he then roasted the servant alive on a revolving pit and then began to eat him. Holy moly that's terrifying. <laughs> Apparently the oven where he cooked the servant can be found today in the Parliament Allowances office. Most likely haunted. In our number 8 spot we have a man named Terrer. Terrer is a man that was born in France around 1772. He was known as an enigma, a man that could literally eat anything and he was always hungry. He was never found to be insane, just someone that was always hungry. So hungry that his parents had to disown him because they couldn't afford to feed him. He would also eat the family pets, so I'm sure that was disturbing and they probably thought him to be evil at the time, just judging by how people thought at that time. Anyways, throughout the years, Terrer actually had some unusual jobs. At one point, he was the warm-up act to a traveling charlatan, swallowing all kinds of animals, stones, cork, and weird objects for show. He then went on to work for the French army, swallowing documents for them. Well, that's one way to dispose of secret documents. Eventually, he agreed to be tested on in a hospital. Unfortunately, he continued his antics here, and they seemingly got worse. He hit 
a new low and began to eat the corpses in the morgue. Why didn't anyone lock this guy up? This guy could be a vampire or a zombie, maybe a combination of the two. In our number seven spot, we have Peter Bryan. Peter Bryan is a man that was born in London, England. His parents immigrated there from Barbados. In 2004, Peter was sent to a psychiatric hospital after admitting to killing a 20 year old shop assistant named Nisha Sheath. In 1995, after being released, for God knows what reason, he ate his friend Brian Cherry. Apparently, the police found him cooking a piece of Brian's brain on a frying pan. Peter admitted to eating the brain with butter and that it was really nice. He also admitted that he would have ate someone else had they not shown up and that he wanted their souls. Ah, lovely. Definitely a real life zombie. He was of course never released again. You would think that they would never release a killer in the first place, but alas, humans never fail to surprise me. Coming up in our number six spot, we have Jarno Elge. Now I may be pronouncing this wrong because this is a Finnish name, but bear with me. Jarno Elge was born in Finland in 1975 and apparently he always had a long history of violence towards animals. So then knowing this, shouldn't surprise you to hear that in 1998, Jarno entered the house of a 23 year old man with some of his friends and proceeded to not only dissect the man, but to devour his insides. Apparently his friends were very much into Satanism and this was supposed to be a satanic ritual. In any case, Jarno was sentenced to life in prison and his friends were sentenced to less than 10 years. So beware because these human eating zombies could be roaming the streets of Finland today. In our number five spot we have Charles. Charles Domery. Charles was known as a Polish soldier who was alive between 1778 to 1800. He was known to have eaten 174 cats in a year. Oh, okay, really, why wasn't this guy locked up? I'm so confused. Where were all the crazy cat ladies at this time? I would have been pounding down his door and demanding his arrest. Anyways, so for some reason, some guy got the bright idea to allow this guy to be a soldier and not hospitalize him. And of course, during his service, he attempted to eat a severed leg of one of his crew members. Apparently, the other crew members managed to get it off of him in time, thankfully, but clearly he was some form of a zombie that tricked a bunch of humans into thinking he was normal. In our number four spot, we have Jose Luis Calva. Jose Luis Calva was born in 1969 in Mexico City. Apparently, Jose had a very troubled life, experiencing being injured by his parents and the death of his father. So of course, that leads us to better understand how he could have possibly gotten to a point of becoming a full-fledged human-eating zombie. Not fully understand, but better understand. In October of 2007, Jose was arrested after the police were on the hunt for his girlfriend, Alejandra Galina, who had been missing. They found him eating a dish of human meat seasoned with lemon. Sounds like a classy guy to me. Bad joke. Apparently they also found the body of the girlfriend in his closet. Her remains were scattered around the kitchen in cereal boxes in the fridge and some of her was still in the frying pan. Yikes. Be careful who you date. In our number three spot, we have Yoo Young Chul. Yoo is known for being a South Korean serial killer and a self-confessed human eater. He lived in poverty growing up, being the product of an unexpected and unwanted pregnancy. Apparently between the time of 2003 to 2004, Yoo killed 21 people. He would take their lives and then he would eat their raw flesh and livers. Whoa. <laughs> he has been on death row in Korea for many, many years, and he has been deemed to have committed some of the worst acts in the history of Korea. In our number two spot, we have Otis Toole. Known for being an accomplice to serial killer Henry Lee Lucas, Otis himself actually confessed to taking the life of many, many people and confessed to many unsolved crimes. But not only that, unlike Henry, Otis was known to eat his victims. He actually confessed this in extreme detail detail to the police and to a comic book author who ended up publishing what he had said. He spoke about his enjoyment with eating humans and how he would eat them with his homemade barbecue sauce. 
Holy moly, that's horrific. In our number one spot, we have Alexander Spesitev. Alexander was born in 1970 in Russia. Another name that was very hard to pronounce. Apparently, he had a horrible upbringing dealing with an unstable and violent father. Alexander was another case where he was found guilty for taking the life of his girlfriend, put in jail and a psychiatric institution, only to be released not long after. Why? I don't understand. Just stop releasing criminals. <laughs> Anyways, he went on to taking the life of many people, some speculate over 80, and he would take the bodies home, cook them, and eat the meat with his mother. When he was caught, he was obviously ruled insane and sentenced to life in prison. His mother was also convicted as an accomplice. A mother-son human eating duo. Just terrifying. Starting off this list in our number 10 spot, we have Nero. To start off this list, we are going to be taking it back all the way to the age of the Roman Empire. When we think back to these times, they weren't necessarily the most kind, peaceful of times, but there certainly are some characters that stand out as being particularly brutal, and one of those is Nero. Throughout his reign, he wreaked havoc on the Roman Empire, he burned cities, he killed thousands of people, including every member of his own family, and I mean, we know the inventive execution methods of the past, so you can probably guess at just how brutal these all were. Most Roman sources give us an almost completely negative review of him in reference to both his personality and his reign as a leader. He was called compulsive and corrupt, and it is believed that he is actually to blame for the great fire that burned Rome, but instead he used the Christians as a scapegoat so that they would receive punishments rather than him. Real stand-up guy. In the end, after being declared a public enemy by the Roman Senate and realizing that the rebellion would be lost, he ended up taking his own life at the age of 30. In our number 9 spot today, we have Robert Picton. This horrible person is one of the worst Canadians to have ever lived and is one of our country's worst serial killers ever. Picton dropped out of school and began working at his family's pig farm, and this is where most of his absolutely horrific crimes took place. He was first arrested in 2002 and was convicted in 2007 of taking the lives of six people, but throughout an extremely lengthy investigation, evidence of many more killings came to light. During his time in jail, an undercover police officer posed as his cellmate, and Picton confessed to 49 crimes to him. Apparently, he was saying to the undercover officer that he wanted to take one more life to make it an even 50, and that he only got caught because he was sloppy. The entire trial was a bit of a mess, but it did lead to a life sentence without the possibility of parole for 25 years, which was the longest possible sentence under Canadian law at the time. This unfortunately does mean that he will be eligible for parole within the next decade, which is a terrifying thought, but being eligible doesn't mean he's going to get it. So. There's always hope. In our number eight spot today, we have Delphine LaLaurie. Delphine was a New Orleans socialite who was an evil person behind closed doors. It is said that in public, Delphine was polite and appeared as if she cared for those who were enslaved in her home, which is truly the most bizarre sentence I've ever said, but I guess back then, that was considered being a good person. I digress, Delphine's social standing remained until on April 10th, 1834, authorities responded to a fire at her Royal Street mansion. When they arrived and went inside, no one was prepared for the horrors that they were about to see as they discovered bound slaves in her attic who had clear signs of violent behavior over a long period of time. Following this, her house was swarmed by an outraged group of New Orleans citizens, but somehow Delphine was able to escape with her family to France. While the angry group destroyed her entire home, Delphine never faced any punishments for her crimes, which is probably the most frustrating ending to this entire story. In our number seven spot today, we have Alexander Solonik. Alexander was known as Alexander the Great, but I'm not sure if great is the word I would use to describe him. He was a Russian gangster who was a pretty notorious hitman for the Russian criminal world. He started out as a member of the Soviet army, but he was quickly kicked out for his violence towards suspects. He actually ended up in prison for some of the things he did. After two years, he ended up escaping, and this is when his contract killing career started. After a few years of living this life, he was apprehended by the police. Once at the station, he revealed a small automatic weapon that they had failed to find on him and he opened fire on the officers. He ran outside where he hit two more officers, but he ended up cornered and hit by a shot himself. After being jailed for a second time, he ended up escaping from prison again, and this time he disappeared. He was later found in Greece with a fake passport and it was here where he started his own little gang of around 50 men, which were of course all involved in shady activities. In 1997, however, his 
his body was found just outside of Athens and this time the tables had turned and he was someone else's victim. Authorities found evidence that he had been hired to carry out a hit in Italy before his death and these two things just may be correlated. In our number 6 spot today we have Elizabeth Wetlaufer. Elizabeth is a former registered nurse and serial killer who was responsible for taking the lives of 8 and attempting to take the lives of another 6 senior citizens who were under her care. With a total of 14 victims that either passed away or were harmed by her actions, she is now one of the worst serial killers Canada has ever seen. And not to mention how she was doing these things to vulnerable people that she was supposed to have devoted her life to taking care of. Her first victim who passed away was James Silcox who was 84 in 2007 and was a World War II veteran. She committed her crimes by injecting insulin into her patients. In September of 2016, Liz ended up entering herself into a drug rehabilitation program at the Center for Addiction and Mental Health, which is located here in Toronto. It was here that she ended up confessing to her horrific crimes. Of course, the staff at the hospital notified the proper authorities and she was subsequently arrested and she gave police a two hour long confession. She admitted to knowing that what she did was wrong, but she said she just had urges she couldn't control. She stated that quote, God or the devil or whatever wanted me to do it. In the end, she was sentenced to life in prison, but because of the way that the Canadian system works, at some point she will be eligible for parole. In our number 5 spot today we have Pedro Lopez. Pedro is a man who lived a life committing some of the most horrific crimes I've ever even heard of throughout South America in the 1970s. By the time the 1980s rolled around, he made a mistake during one of his awful crimes and this led to his arrest. Once in police custody, he began to basically explain his entire life story and he confessed to an astronomical amount of crimes. People were a little skeptical of just how many crimes he said he committed, but Pedro was able to lead them to a mass grave where they recovered a total of 53 people's remains. Pedro of course went to jail, but get this, he was somehow released in 1994. I'm like, great, just before I was born, nice. He wasn't sent home straight away and instead was sent to some sort of mental institution for three years, but he was also released from there. Okay, so aside from the crimes he committed, are you ready for the worst part? In 2002, he was suspected of being the perpetrator of a new crime, but no one has been able to find him since 1998. Yeah, he disappeared, awesome. In our number four spot today, we have Ilsa Cook. Ilsa is a war criminal who oversaw concentration camps that were run by her husband, Carl Otto Cook. She is well known due to her sadistic and brutal treatment of prisoners and she became one of the first well known people that committed these types of crimes to be tried by the US military. It is said that those being held at the camps with distinctive tattoos, Ilsa would take a piece of their skin as souvenirs. When being charged with her crimes, they included things like private enrichment, embezzlement, as well as taking the lives of some prisoners to prevent them from testifying. In the original trial, she was acquitted for lack of evidence, although her husband was sentenced to death by an SS court in Munich. After a few more trials, however, she ended up being sentenced to life in prison, and despite multiple appeal attempts, she was never released. In our number three spot today, we have Joseph Stalin. Stalin was a Georgian revolutionary and Soviet political leader who governed the Soviet Union from 1922 until his death in 1953. Despite the fact that he started his time governing the country as part of a collective leadership, by the 1930s he had consolidated all of the power and went on to begin acting as the Soviet Union's dictator. During his reign, Stalin was responsible for the deaths of over 60 million people, 20 million of them being his own. Apparently the math works out to be about 40,000 people per week, which is truly unbelievable. It is worth noting, especially since this list is about people who were born evil, that there were good things that he did at some point or another. I mean Stalin's forces did start out as an Axis power in World War II and he did help us out a great deal and helped to bring down you know who, but in the end, that good can't eliminate the harm that he did. Also, before he was in power, it is said that as a young man, he was a robber and an assassin. For almost 30 years, he reigned the Soviet Union with terror and violence. I mean, his decisions led to a famine that killed millions of people alone. Also, the lives he took weren't just of enemies. I mean, how could one person have 60 million enemies? He would take the lives of the families of people he liked. 
he just took too many lives, was too paranoid, and while he was powerful and smart, he was also an absolute monster. This is all perfectly summed up when he said, quote, one death is a tragedy, a million deaths is simply a statistic. In our number two spot today, we have Pol Pot. Pol Pot was the leader of the Cambodian revolutionary group called the Khmer Rouge, and this group, with him at the forefront, went on to try and destroy Cambodian civilization. This wasn't necessarily how the group started out, but once Pol and others who shared his ideas came to lead it, things quickly became dark. He is likely one of the only people who ordered a mass genocide in his own country. The reasoning behind all of this is because he believed that destroying the civilization was the best way to start a new regime and bring in a new age. He ended up serving as the Prime Minister from 1976 until 1979, during which his policies led to the deaths of around 2 million people, which is horrifying. That was about 25% of the entire population. He even liked to keep the skulls of those he had killed. I'm just gonna say, it seems as though politics was the mask for someone who just really wanted to kill. There are so many horrific details surrounding him and the things he did, some of which I can't even repeat here on YouTube, and that is exactly how he landed a spot here on today's list. He truly did some horrendous things and in the end went on to live the rest of his life and died of natural causes before he could answer for any of his crimes. In our number one spot today we have Heinrich Himmler. Alright, this is one real piece of work who was very active on what we'll call the bad team during World War II, and he is actually one of the people who really helped to create and build the Holocaust. He was the head of the SS and he controlled concentration camps, and you want to know what he was best known for? His organizational skills and for picking the best subordinates. Yeah, they really liked him because he was able to pick the other best worst people ever to work with him. That's absolutely insane. They say opposites attract, but in this case it was just terrible people joining other terrible people. He believed that certain groups of people, like Jewish people, were unworthy of living, and he himself ordered the deaths of six million. It is completely unimaginable just how evil this person really was. This hasn't exactly been verified, but it's something that's been said for years, and that is that he had furniture made from the skins and bones of these people. In the end, because he was nothing but a coward, when things for him and his party started to go south, he tried to have open peace talks with the Western allies behind the back of you know who. Of course, he found out and had Himmler dismissed from all of his posts and ordered his arrest. This led Himmler to try and to go into hiding, but he was detained and then arrested by British forces once his identity became known. To make this story even worse, while in custody he took his own life because of course, he didn't want to answer for his terrible actions. Mm -hmm.